Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning for our webinar. Um, my name is Amy Rectanis, and I'm very pleased that today we will be um, hosting Brian Norton, who is the Director of Assistive Technology at Easter Seals Crossroad. He's going to be speaking to us about in data, communication, and other assistive technologies. Give you a little information about Brian. He, uh, he started his career at Easter Seals Crossroads in 1997 and currently serves as the Director of Assistive Technology. He is responsible for the day-to-day -day operations of Clinical Assistive Technology and the InData Project, which is a federally funded statewide assistive technology program for the agency. He utilizes his many years of experience to provide direction, leadership, and training to a diverse and highly skilled team of AT specialists. He holds a bachelor's degree from Anderson University and is a RESNA Certified Assistive Technology Professional, or ATP, and a Certified Ergonomic Assessment Specialist, or CEAS. Brian, if you're ready, I'm going to go ahead and switch it over to you. All right. Sounds good. There you go. All right. So let me bring up my PowerPoint. Um, well, first of all, let me just say I am so happy and super excited to be here with you guys today. Uh, hopefully you guys can see my slides now. Um, and so, yeah, we want to, um, first off, again, thank you for inviting me to be a part of this. Um, glad to meet all of you. I believe we'll jump into some questions at the end, but I think the purpose of today is I want to spend a little bit of time, just a little bit of our time talking about an overview of the AT services here at Easter Seals Crossroads. Um, and then um, spend most of our time kind of talking about different types of technologies. And so um, we'll jump into things for communication, things like IoT, which is the internet of things, to be able to control your home um, and some other things as we get going. So, but first off, we'll talk a little bit about the services we offer here um, at Easter Seals Crossroads, specifically in data project, um, which I think could be vitally important for a lot of folks. Um, and then also our clinical services as well. So the InData project um, is Indiana's Assistive Technology Act. So every state and every territory um, has a project like this. Um, um, it's actually federal legislation um, that was passed um, along with the ADA um, back in the day, um, looking at as technology develops, um, how it could be useful for folks with disabilities um, to be more independent um, in their daily lives. And so um, just a little bit of background, it's a federally funded grant program. Um, and again, every state, every territory has it. Um, and uh, with the InData project, we have two overarching goals. Um, the first one is we spread the word about assistive technology. We want folks to understand and know what assistive technology is, um, how it can be helpful, um, and essentially how it works. And so we spent a lot of time um, out um, covering, kind of covering um, those types of topics with individuals. And then the second thing that we do is we work really hard to get people's hands on assistive technology. And we'll talk a little bit about a couple of the ways we do that as well. So when we think about outreach um, and information sharing, um, a couple of the ways we do that is we have an information referral line. Uh, so we have our 800 number up there on the screen and our email address. Doesn't matter uh, if you're looking for uh, uh, a computer with an adaptive piece of software or maybe an ADL, you know, aids for activities of daily living or, or other types of things. If you have an accommodation need or a client of yours has an accommodation need, um, we would love for you to reach out to us. Um, there may be something that we can offer through the InData project, um, or we have lots of different community partners throughout the state that we can engage or send information to, to be able to put you in touch with folks that might be helpful. And so um, information referral is a big way that we um, get tons and tons of calls from folks um, who just need different types of accommodations. Um, and uh, we'll get into some of what that looks like. So we also do AT hours, talking about an hour, provide some hands-on experiences. If you guys are a part of support groups or other types of groups um, and would love to have us come out, we'd love to be able to do that. Um, and so you can just give us a call in that way as well. And then four to five times a year, uh, we do full day trainings. Um, these are absolutely free. They're based here in Indianapolis out of our um, Indianapolis location here at Easter Seals Crossroads, but we stream them online, realizing that not everybody has the flexibility and freedom to kind of make it back down here to Indy. Um, and those take the form of, of essentially 
a full day training where we focus on some aspect of assistive technology. And so we might do assistive technology for um, for folks who are aging um, or uh, for folks who have brain injury or, uh, you know, this year, I believe we've got um, Teresa Wilcom, who is the New Hampshire director of their Assistive Technology Act coming in um, in August, talking about Text, creating tech solutions in minutes. So real simple ways to take different things like PVC pipe and other types of glue and tape and other household items and creating different useful um, technologies for folks to be able to kind of help them be more independent. And then the other thing we do is we do a lot with social media and podcasts, but information and outreach is a big aspect of what the End Data Project does. Probably where the rubber hits the road a little bit more concretely for folks, um, and specifically for folks in your situation, um, is we work really hard to get people's hands on assistive technology as well. And so a couple of the ways that we do that, uh, we have a demo and lending library um, that's a part of our program, um, and where we can do to your door demonstrations of various assistive technology devices. Um, we have about 2,500 items in our library. Those are available for 30-day loans. Um, only for folks here in Indiana, um, but um, you can borrow equipment from us for 30 days free of charge. Um, and it really just gives that op an opportunity for folks to help with some with some decision making, um, the, try the chance to be able to try it out before you buy it. Um, it works a lot like your public library for books. Um, when you go into the library, you check out a book. It really is just that easy to borrow maybe a computer with an adaptive piece of software, maybe it's a amplified phone system, maybe it's an alerting system or a personal listening system for, for someone who's hard of hearing, lots of different types of technologies in there. Um, it is uh, available, you can, you can kind of search our library. Um, if you go to eastersealstech.com, that's easterseals.tech.com, you can, um, you can take a look at all of the different items. You can sign up for an account. Um, we do have folks sign up for an account, but then you have access and you can kind of look through our library to see what types of items we have available there. Uh, but again, along with that, uh, we do have someone on staff who will go with that equipment to your door anywhere in the state of Indiana and provide demonstrations, which are really like 20 to 30 minute test drives of that equipment, kind of showing you the bells and whistles of how things work. Uh, and then he'll leave it with you for 30 days, letting you try it out to see if it's something that really um, makes sense um, for the particular person uh, or need that you have. So um, great, great opportunity to be able to get your hands on equipment without having to spend a lot of money. The other thing that we have is the InData Depot, um, where we have a computer and assistive technology reutilization program. Um, so we take in donated assistive technology or computers. Uh, for the assistive technology, things like video magnifiers or other AT devices, uh, we take those, we sanitize those, we repair them as best we can, and then we make those available for free of charge to folks throughout Indiana. Um, disability is one of those things um, uh, that we um, have a lot of uh, old equipment out there um, or older equipment, um, not outdated, but older equipment out there that, that folks have in their homes, um, you know, maybe um, someone has a disability and they, they get better, they don't need it anymore, uh, whatever equipment they were using, um, they can donate that, that, donate that equipment back to us. Uh, or um, it may be um, disabilities degenerative in nature a lot of times and what they were using is no longer useful for them and they need something a little bit different. And so again, they have the opportunity to donate that to us. We also have a lot of families um, who have equipment. Um, and unfortunately, if someone passes away, they're stuck with equipment that they're not quite sure what to do with. And it's not something that um, um, they want to keep around, um, but then they want to be able to donate that as well. And so they can donate all of that old equipment to us. And then we will um, look for new homes um, and have individuals contacting us all the time to be able to kind of put that type of equipment in there because they don't have a funding source and it's free of charge. Um, probably the more... Um, prevalent thing that we do in there is we do computer recycling. And so we accept donated computers, we wipe them of all their previous data, um, and then we refurbish those and put a new hard drive in, some additional RAM, we install Windows um, in Microsoft Office on those computers, and then we give those away to folks throughout the state of Indiana um, who, who need a computer. And so it's a great way for folks if they don't have a computer and they would like a computer to be able to um, 
be in touch with family, friends, surf the internet, do those kinds of things, um, they can get a free computer. And that's an application-based program. Folks who qualify for that program, um, you have to be a resident of Indiana, have a documented disability, uh, and those are really the only two things um, that are required for that particular program. Uh, we also do an alternative financing program, uh, which is a low interest extended term financial loan program uh, where folks can purchase their own assistive technology. We realize that not everybody has funding sources like voc rehab or Medicaid funds are limited um, in nature. And so at times folks need to be able to uh, apply for financing to be able to purchase different types of equipment. Um, obviously, you can see what can be, what can it be used for. There's lots of different things it can be used for. Um, you can borrow between $500 and $35,000. Um, and again, Indiana residents, you have to have a documented disability. Um, but it's real simple. And, and here's the here's the the great part about this. A lot of the folks that we work with don't have great credit. Um, this is an opportunity for them to build credit. Uh, but also, because it's a low interest extended term financial loan program. Um, if you put something on a credit card or try to purchase something on a credit card, you're usually running about 18% interest, probably more. Um, and the loans that we are able to offer um, through Star Financial, which is based out of Fort Wayne, um, uh, we offer most of the loans that we close are between 3 and 4% um, interest rate. And so they're very, very low. Um, and then with the extended terms, we're able to spread that out over a longer period of time, making those payments uh, minimal um, as, as much as we can um, so that they're more affordable for the folks that apply. And so um, it's just a great way for folks to be able to apply for for some to get some money um, to be able to purchase their own assistive technology if they're not tied to a a resource or a funding source. Uh, we also have a clinical assistive technology program here as well. Um, and our clinical program is, is a more comprehensive program. And so that is where we meet with individuals one on one. Um, and so uh, and we really kind of dig into the details or get into the weeds with them about what the need is. Um, and we can make recommendations based on what we find. Um, so we would uh, typically evaluations and consult consultations is where things start. Um, and so that's where a qualified professional will meet with the individual one on one. Uh, once we meet with them, we'll talk about what their needs are, what they're trying to do, what they're having difficulty with. We'll kind of explore their disability a little bit with them and, and, and what's challenging about that and what makes that challenging as it compares to the task that they're trying to perform. Um, and then we would then come up with a report. We'll write a report back to a funding source um, to be able to then recommend particular adaptive technologies that would meet that need. Um, sometimes you don't need a full-blown evaluation. Sometimes a consultation um, would, would do just fine. And that's typically a lot shorter and less comprehensive. Um, and it allows us to kind of pop in and pop out as needs arise to be able to offer um, some professional advice on, on the situation. And so there's consultations as a part of that as well. Um, and then as with all technology, whenever we recommend something and it's been provided to the client, um, we really believe in training uh, it, it, that training is probably the most important thing you can do with equipment. Um, it's essential part of the accommodation process. We try to individualize that as much as we can to the user so that they get the best experience and, and learning environment to be able to use that equipment and get comfortable with it. Um, and a lot of times, depending on the person and their tech savviness, um, we can do that mostly in person is what we would typically do. Um, but if they're tech savvy, we might be able to do that um, online as well. Um, and then reduce travel charges for that. So uh, we also offer support. We have a 24 hour technical support line. So if they have problems or anybody has problems with their assistive technology, um, you can get a hold of us. Um, if you go to EasterSealsTech.com, um, there's a phone number there that you can give us a call um, and it'll put you into a support line to be able to reach us. As far as the folks we serve in clinical assistive technology, we're all inclusive as far as disabilities are concerned. So physical, cognitive, sensory, intellectual. Um, there's really not um, a disability that we don't have some experience with um, on our team. Um, ages served, um, all ages, children and adults. And again, that's a statewide service. Um, and so most of the services here at Easter Seals Crossroads are more central Indiana located. Um, but um, our assistive technology program is a statewide program. 
Um, and the qualifications are down there as well. Just we, we spend a lot of time making sure that our folks are competent um, with with the with the services that they provide and the equipment that they're recommending. And so um, making sure that, you know, we have the correct qualifications to be able to stand there with the individual and make um, professional recommendations based on what type of equipment and the need that they have. And so that's a little bit about our clinical assistive technology program as well. So without further ado, um, I thought I'd just kind of jump into assistive technology. Uh, and the first thing I wanted to do is just kind of say and talk a little bit about what it is. Um, so assistive technology is really, it's a generic term for devices and modifications that help people overcome or remove barriers created by their disability. Um, and for me, I kind of I kind of go with a little bit more uh, simple definition. Um, it's really anything that's going to help someone do something they wouldn't otherwise be able to do. Um, and so that could be a piece of equipment or it could be just a different way of doing things. Um, and I think um, it could be a system. So instead of um, let me think of an example of this instead of. Uh, with with my mail, instead of me having to kind of um, read that myself, maybe I or, or the way I collect my mail um, again, it's just it's. Maybe I don't have a really great concrete one here <laughs> as I talk, but um, but it's just a different way of doing things. And I think we all kind of do that day in and day out with the different things that we find ourselves doing. And so, again, think of it beyond just equipment um, and think of it. We just need to do something differently for us to be able to accomplish that particular task. And so um, just a couple of different ways to look at what assistive technology is. Um, and then what's the big deal? Um, you know, the importance for AT, I don't know about you, but when I got up this morning, um, I have my alarm clock right next to my bed. Um, I'm able to um, get up um, and get going in the morning. Coffee um, in the morning is, is vital to me. Um, and so I got my coffee maker going. It helps me make my coffee, helps me wake up a little bit more. I carry around my smartphone. I carry around my computer. Um, and really, for me, it, all of those things just make my life a little bit easier. Um, helps me stay in contact with folks. Um, it helps me get up in the morning. Uh, but I would say arguably that for persons with disability, technology really kind of makes things possible. It opens the door to a lot of things that, again, they might not otherwise have been able to do um, on their own. And really, here are the goals for assistive technology. What we're really trying to do when we introduce a piece of equipment or a different way of doing things is we're really trying to help them be more efficient or effective at a particular task. Um, we're trying to help decrease the degenerative nature of a disability, um, support or replace skills that may have been altered by illness or accident. Um, obviously, avoid injury. Um, some things or different tasks can be risky, and so we want to make sure that there's a simple, effective way to do it that's going to help them be safe when they do it. Um, but I would argue, ultimately, um, really everything that we do through NData and our clinical program, it's all about independence. We want people to be and, and help them be as independent as possible in all aspects of their life, whether that's at home, at work, at school, at play. Um, in the community, um, independence kind of rules the day. And we're kind of looking at that as kind of where we want um, to get people to. And so um, independence um, is probably the, the key word there. So I wanted to jump into a little bit of technology. Um, um, we kind of talked a little bit beforehand about the different types of things that we wanted to talk to. Um, and um, communication was one of those things that was brought up initially. And so I wanted to talk about assistive technology for communication um, off the bat. Um, and really communication can take all forms. Um, there's written, there's spoken, there's non-written <laughs> or non-verbal. Um, ways of communicating. There's phone calls, there's emails, there's text messages, lots of different things in life this day, these days that help us communicate one thing or another. Um, and so um, when you think about communication, a couple of activities of daily living, um, obviously communication kind of falls into that. Um, a couple of things I just want to throw out there, you know, for writing, there's lots of different writing tools. These are just a couple of them. You look at the ring pen, um, that's an anti-fatigue pen up there. Um, there's a writing bird. Um, if folks are comfortable with writing, but maybe they just have a difficulty holding a pen, there's lots of different adaptive 
um, things for to help folks with with writing aids. Um, typically, an occupational therapist would work with individuals with these types of things, making sure that if this is a particular thing that they want to learn or regain a skill in, um, handwriting specifically, um, they would work with them with these different types of writing aids. We do have some of these available in our library for folks to borrow, um, but again, just a, Handwriting is a great way to communicate if that's something that they can do. And there's a couple of there's lots of different options out there as far as being able to help them hold a pen um, and then put pen to paper. Down below the pens, the writing bird and the ring pen, you'll find the writing guides um, or raised line or bold lined paper. Uh, those help folks stay within the lines. Um, and so the writing guide on the left, um, that is made out of plastic. I um, mean, it goes over a sheet of paper and kind of covers a sheet of paper. Um, and as a person writes, they write within um, the plastic guidelines. And so um, they don't let them run from line to line. Um, same thing with the raised line or bold lined paper. It just gives them a better reference point, something that they can feel and, and know if they're kind of trailing off or going above or below a particular line and hopefully makes their writing a lot more legible um, as they use that. Uh, phone is another um, way to communicate as well. Um, so over here on the top left or top right, we have an amplified phone. Uh, we have lots of different ampli amplified phones. We have cordless phones. We have these types of phones with pictures, symbols on the top for quick reference and being able to call folks very, very quickly. Um, this particular phone has that red bar on the bottom that will actually flash for individuals. Um, if a phone call is coming in, so giving them some sort of a visual cue that the phone is ringing. Um, it's also very, very loud. Um, so you have an adjustable volume on that where you can increase or decrease not only the volume of the person speaking to you, but also the loud, how loud the ringer is um, um, if a person's hard of hearing. So um, lots of things you can do with amplified phones. Uh, and then below that is a flasher. Uh, these have been around for a long, long time. Uh, you know, lots of office settings will have it, but particularly for folks who are hard of hearing, uh, whenever the phone rings, uh, that little thing will send off a very um, bright pulse of, of light um, and will continue as, as long as the phone rings. And so as your phone rings, um, again, you're getting a visual cue for what's happening there. I think a lot of times uh, working with individuals, we're looking at augmentative communication devices. Um, and there's a couple of different types of augmentative communication devices that are out there. Um, augmentative communication are devices that specifically help folks who um, have difficulty expressing themselves or have difficulty communicating, be able to use a device to do it for them. Um, and so they are able to use um, uh, something that may look like this one. This is actually an app on, that you can get for an iPad or an Android device. It's called Verbally. And um, Verbally allows you to do text input. Um, and so as you look at this particular screen, uh, notice at the very top you have words and phrases tabs. Um, and so you, you ha actually could select a word. It'll go ahead and put it into the text field. Um, and then by pressing the speak button on the right hand side, it would go ahead and speak that for you. Um, and so if you're um, cognitively aware enough and know and understand words, using a device like this might make sense um, where you can either type in or use um, the predictive word prediction at the very top to be able to create phrases and then have the device speak it for you. Uh, you can also, over on the right hand side, you see that common phrase area. If you have folks who speak uh, a common phrase all the time uh, uh, and they give a typical response, um, you can go ahead, go ahead and have common phrases put there. Uh, and then they would just have to touch that um, phrase that they want and then hit the speak button. It would speak it for them as well. So there are lots of different text style augmentative communication devices like this. Verbally is one. There's another one called Proloquo for text, which is very good. Um, but again, typically those, that, with those devices, um, folks are typing in whatever they want to say or using the predictive word prediction at the very top to be able to type in different responses and then having the device speak for them. The other example of augmentative communication devices are symbol-based communication devices. Um, this is an example of Proloquo to go. Um, that is also an app for Android and Apple devices. Uh, and in these, uh, 
you're really working with pictures. And so it's great for persons who have difficulty with literacy skills. Um, and the symbols offer a visual representation of a word or idea. And so they can associate a picture with, a, with an idea or a word and then be able to create sentences or phrases. And again, have that device speak to them. Uh, we have all sorts of different devices in our loan library. Um, these are a few of those. Uh, the first one on the top left hand corner is a step by step communicator. Um, and that's really ideal for turn taking or giving a series of instructions or expressing thoughts in a way. Um, and so what happens is each touch of the activation surface, so each touch of that green button advances messages in a sequence. And so that has three messages that you can tie together to be able to then um, string a series of, of thoughts or a series of instructions um, together for an individual. And so um, those are called step-by-step -step communicators. Down below it, uh, you have um, kind of a, a direct select. You get four choices there. Um, you can press the button for one that you want. And so you're using pictures um, as a guide for folks to be able to choose um, something that they need. In the middle, you have the GoTalk 9. That also comes in a 20 and a 32 um, grid. Um, so there's nine squares right here. Um, but what's nice about the GoTalks is they're a little bit more sophisticated than the step-by-step -step communicators um, in that they have overlays and those overlays get pulled in and out from the right-hand side there. And so if you have different um, uh, different things that the person does or different uh, activities that the person does each day, those can be pulled in and out um, and the display will then recognize the whatever overlays in there and then they can give um, context sensitive communication based on what activity uh, they're, they're participating in. And then again, you have very sophisticated devices like Toby Dynavox. Um, those are pretty popular devices these days. Um, and those are uh, picture-based, and I believe you also have a text-based. I think you get both of those um, within the Toby Dynavox software. Um, but those are pretty expensive devices, um, but they do offer a lot of opportunities for folks to get access um, to the device in that you can um, use it, either do direct select where you can press the screen um, and the buttons that you want to be able to produce your sentences or phrases, or you can use eye gaze systems or switch access depending on the person's need and, and how complex their, their needs are. So uh, lots of flexibility with, with Toby Dynavox devices. They are a lot more expensive than some of the more simple ways to communicate, but um, do uh, a pretty good job and, and can offer quite a bit there. As far as communication devices, we have lots and lots of communication devices. All of these different things are in our library. If, if folks are interested in borrowing those types of things, we'd be happy to be able to set that loan up for you. Kind of the next area I wanted to talk a little bit about are smart homes. Um, I'd met a couple of folks at the NRF conference yesterday. I spent a whole session on smart homes and um, had planned to go ahead and even spend a little bit of time today on this as well. And so smart homes are kind of, uh, one of the more up and coming types of technologies um, that are out there, it, it's been happening for a while. Uh, when I started 22 years ago, um, folks were using environmental control units that cost a whole lot of money, um, anywhere from 10 to $15,000, depending on the different types of devices you wanted to control. Um, and they would require you to um, have someone come and spend a couple of weeks with you setting things up, making sure things are connected, that the computer was programmed, and that your device could then activate those or turn on and off those different things in and around your home. Well, nowadays, it's a pretty much a DIY kind of world where um, there are intelligent personal assistants out there. Um, the one that I'll kind of focus on today um, are Amazon Echo devices. Uh, these devices you can pick up just about anywhere. Uh, you can buy them off of Amazon, obviously, or you can go to big box hardware stores or office supply stores. Um, you can pretty much purchase them really anywhere. Uh, what makes them unique in this space is you can buy an Echo Dot, which is the smaller version down there on the bottom, and that's $39.99 typically. Um, but you can buy them at Christmas for around $25, and so they're pretty inexpensive. But they allow you to do a whole lot. Um, and so it's more than just a speaker. Um, some of the things that you can do with this, you can set alarms, timers, and reminders. So if you need, fo if you have folks who need prompting um, or 
um, prompting throughout the day to be able to start or stop a task. Um, you can set those things up beforehand. Um, you can get information to help prepare yourself for the day, finding out what the weather's like. You know, do I need to wear a jacket um, or can I wear my short sleeves today? Um, you can play music or have it read a book. Um, but again, then most notably for folks, it's about controlling your environment. Um, and we're seeing a lot of headway with this types of with these types of things for folks with disabilities. And what used to cost you between ten and fifteen thousand dollars to be able to put a system in your home, well now you can kind of do it on your own using some of the smart technology that's out there. Um, and so here are some examples of some smart plugs or switches. Um, so just about everything, lights, fans, anything that has an on or off switch in your home can be controlled through the Amazon Echo. Um, so for instance, if you would plug a light into one of these modules um, and then do a little programming with the Amazon Echo, um, you could then say, Alexa, turn light on. Um, and it would go ahead and turn that on for you. Same thing with all of the other different appliances that have the on and off feature to them, like fans, lights, um, and other things in and around your home. And again, with that, what you're thinking about is, again, a 25 at Christmas, or I'll even just use regular price, it's a $39.99 Echo Dot with a $25 lamp module to be able to then turn on and off your lights on your own, creating more independence for individuals um, in their home. Another example of this, Nest Cam and Amazon Cloud Cams. Uh, these are really, really helpful. I have, I have a few of these. This is kind of my security system at home, um, but these are smart cameras and they also connect to the Amazon devices. Um, and basically what's really cool about them is they're smart in that they sense motion. They also sense sound. And not only do they sense those things, but they will send you notifications that someone is at your door or someone's in your kitchen or someone's in your garage, those kinds of things. Um, it's also smart enough to know when it hears a sound, what that sound might be. Um, and so throughout the day, I get notifications that say, I heard a dog and you're barking in your kitchen, um, or I heard a dog barking in your office, um, those kinds of things. And so uh, it's really, really smart in that way. It also provides you the opportunity to do audio feedback. So um, I have a two-way speaker um, so that uh, if someone's in my home, I can talk with them and then they can talk with me um, through the camera as well. And I think, again, for folks with disabilities, what makes this really unique and interesting and helpful um, is that, you know, a lot of our individuals um, that I work with um, use or require attendant care to help get them up and going in the morning. Um, and a lot of times they're dependent on, uh, I kind of think their health and safety is um, something to be concerned with because they're not really sure who's coming in and out of their home because they're back in the bedroom and they don't have anything out there to know who's at the front door. They kind of just trust that whoever is supposed to be there at a particular time is going to be the right person. And then they're letting these folks in and out of their homes. And with smart cameras, now I can see, I can talk, um, and I can uh, be alerted that someone's there um, and let them in myself instead of having to have that trust in, in whoever uh, is at my front door and just letting them come in and out. And so there's smart cam cameras out there as well. There's also smart thermostats, lots of different things out there, uh, uh, appliances, you know, your dishwasher, your ovens, your microwaves, your washers, your dryers, they're all smart devices. Um, and again, can be activated or controlled through intelligent personal assistance, um, uh, like the Echo or the Google Home, uh, as well. So lots of different options and things that are happening with the Internet of Things. The benefits for folks, um, and this is kind of, again, we're looking for increased productivity. Um, you're able to record tasks or to-dos very quickly. So um, during the day, you know, I'm at home and something comes to mind, you want to be able to capture that thought or idea. Um, you can just say, hey, Alexa, remember this or remind me to do this tomorrow morning at what's in such and such a time and it's going to go ahead and record that and send it to my calendar. Um, it saves time and money. Uh, a lot of times when I'm out and about, um, I'm able to, um, you know, have a grocery list there with me to be able to get those, get those things um, as I'm, so I just have to say it and it goes and it saves me a lot of time and remembering and helping me get, get, save time and money in that in that way. Obviously, there's easier control of our environment. 
um, improved health and safety, better decision making, and again, always increased independence. So let's take a couple of examples of this and kind of real life use cases. Um, there are a lot of smart devices that are related to health um, these days. And so um, I don't know about you, but when I go to the doctor, um, I sit on that table and as the doctor comes in, I have a hard time explaining to them exactly how I'm feeling. I can never quite get it together or get or get the words out there to really give them a full sense of how I'm feeling during the day. Uh, well, now there are lots of different fitness trackers and other types of things out there for individuals that record your vital signs throughout the day um, and uh, over periods of time. And those things can transmit that information directly to a healthcare professional um, where then they have real time data on basically your vital signs all the time so that they can see um, as things go up or down, they have, a, they have a history of that and we can then relate that back to what you're doing at different times. Um, and so there's a lot of health applications instead of having to kind of rely on your ability to be able to communicate or um, express how you feel, now you have devices that can take your blood pressure, can take an echocardiogram and do all sorts of things that are connected to apps that and those apps connect you back to the healthcare professional where they're getting real time data. Um, and so health is a big thing. Obviously we talked about controlling your environment um, and so being able to turn on things on in and around your home. Uh, safety and security or security and safety there as well with those cameras. We talked a little bit about that as well. And so there's a lot of real life use cases when it comes to um, technologies like these. Uh, and so um, just a lot to be done in that area. Um, and another thing that's coming up quite a bit these days is remote monitoring with folks. Um, and so um, allowing folks to be able to kind of use these types of technologies to help monitor their their family members or folks in their homes to make sure that they're okay. And if they're at home by themselves, that if something happens, someone is able to be notified and can be told and um, help can, can be on the way. And so there's a whole lot uh, with that. We'll jump into next, AT for hard of hearing as well. Um, and so as we jump into this, obviously there's lots of different things um, that can be found um, to be able to help folks who are deaf or hard of hearing um, know what's going on in their environment. Um, and a lot of those things take the form of flashing or vibrating alert systems. Um, a couple of those things are here. Um, uh, so we've got a, uh, basically a, a visual doorbell for folks so that when you press the doorbell, the light will flash in a room. Uh, we've got flashing fire alarms. Um, so if you can't hear the fire alarm, they will flash as well. Have that fla phone flasher again. Um, that Clarity Alert Master um, does lots of things for you. It'll tell you if it hears a knock at the door, here's a phone call, here's a doorbell. Um, if there's motion in a particular room, um, it will alert you by flashing lights in and around your home for that. Um, and then on the right side, we have a sonic bomb alarm clock um, with a bed shaker. Um, that's something that I might need in the morning sometimes um, so that not only does it have a really, really loud alarm, but it'll also shake your bed um, so that you wake up as well. So uh, a lot of times, um, depending on the person's home, if they're renting a home or those kinds of things, a lot of times we ask them to talk to um, the folks who own those those homes or um, if they're if they're uh, if, if they ha already have something in their home and they're wanting it to be, have a vibrating or lighted alert paired with it, um, we ask them to talk to the manufacturers. A lot of times they can find out if that can be accommodated directly from the manufacturer. So um, lots of things with flashing or vibrating alert systems. And again, we have these things in our loan library um, for folks to be able to borrow um, to try out and see if it works for them. Other things uh, kind of goes back to that AT for, for communication, but um, but also has some additional stuff on here. There are those amplified phone systems that we talked about before, um, but also there are captioning phone systems as well. Um, and so if a person um, is hard of hearing, uh, they can use a captioning phone system and it kind of talks a little bit about how that works essentially um, you're the CapTel user on the left-hand side and you're talking, uh, you're trying to communicate directly to the other person. Um, so as, as you talk to somebody, 
and they talk back to you, whatever they say comes back up on the screen and text on the screen. So there's someone actually listening into your conversation and captioning that as it's being spoken. So um, it makes for communicating on the phone much, much um, simpler and easier. Um, those are actually available a lot of times for free to individuals uh, through Intrac. Intrac is a is one of our um, friends or partners um, in all of this, and they do um, provide the captioning service here in Indiana, but they also have these caption phones and that there's an income limit and some things like that and application process. But a lot of times those phones are absolutely free for folks um, if they need something like a captioning phone uh, to be able to be able to have conversations on the phone with folks. Spend a little bit of time on AT for low vision as well. Um, one of the most helpful things that's out there for folks uh, with low vision uh, are desktop video magnifiers. So if you have an individual who's trying to read uh, documentation or, or different things, maybe it's their mail, maybe it's um, you know a form they need to fill out, uh, a desktop video magnifier is probably one of the most widely used devices um, by persons with low vision. Um, and it's real simple in the way it's put together. Um, it typically consists of a video magnifier um, or video camera um, connected with the zoom lens so they can zoom in and out on something. And it has a very large monitor, um, sometimes you know, 20 inches or 24 inch monitor. Um, and the features that it provides is obviously adjustable levels of magnification. There's color inversion, um, which can be really helpful for folks with low vision so that they can see things better. A lot of times, um, as in the picture, there's white, there's black text on a white background. A lot of times that white background produces too much glare for folks to be able to see. And so they can reverse that and it would turn into white text on a black background. It'll invert that for the person so they can see it a little bit better. There's guidelines in different bars. So you can actually hone in on a particular area of the screen. Um, the table that he's using on the bottom where his hands are, that is actually movable and it's an XY table to go up and down, left and right um, and allow them to build easily be able to kind of magnify and read the materials. And so um, lots of uses for desktop magnifiers. Now, a lot of the folks that we work with, um, a lot of them need something more portable than a desktop. They, they're on the move, they're, they leave their home, they go different places and they need something to bring with them. Um, and so there are portable video magnifiers, handheld ones. Um, obviously you can go to a lot of um, different places like Walgreens or CVS uh, to be able to pick up you know, glass handheld magnifiers. Um, so those are readily available at all your pharmacies. Uh, but if you're looking for a video one that acts as much, much more in line with what the desktop video magnifier does, um, you can find different ones like that. So we have an example of a Ruby XL HD on the left and a Pebble HD on the right. Um, those have little LED screens on them uh, and offer the same features for the individual that the desktop magnifier does. And so you have the ability to be able to zoom in and zoom out, the ability to be able to then change the contrast. And with these devices, you can actually take a picture because sometimes uh, if you're if you're trying to read something and it's in an awkward position, maybe you're in a file drawer, maybe you're um, leaning over or looking at it's just an awkward position, um, you want to be able to take a picture of something then you can stand back up or sit back up and then read it in a more comfortable position. And so you can take a picture with of it. And then once you hit the picture button again, it goes away and you're back to video magnifying in real time. And so lots of different things with portable video magnifiers as well. And then there are lots of apps out there too. Um, I don't think we can um, really overlook the impact that mobile devices have had for individuals. Um, and there are some tremendous apps being designed that can be really, really helpful for just about anybody. It doesn't matter what your need is. Um, uh, there are lots of different apps being developed that can make a big impact for folks. One of the ones that I've seen and, and is turning into one of my most favorite apps because it's it's really got a lot of things built all into one, um, is called Seeing AI app. Uh, that app is actually made by Microsoft. Um, and so Microsoft 
has a lot of options. Uh, this particular, we're seeing Microsoft get into the game a lot more recently, um, and uh, the Seeing AI app is one of those things. And what it does is allows you to be able to take a picture of just about anything and instantly have it recognized and read back to you. Um, and that can include text, money, a scene or a picture of what you're looking at, people, handwriting, barcodes, objects, lots of different things. And so um, I've got a video here that I'll show you of just what that does for folks. And so seeing AI, it, it does a whole lot for folks and um, can offer quite a bit for folks. So let me make sure, get into feedback here. So yeah, there's a, there's a whole lot you can do with seeing AI um, and what it can do for folks with just the artificial intelligence that's out there that allows uh, the computer to be able to describe or figure out what you're looking at. Um, and how that's how that's working for folks. And so um, if you're interested in a real, it's a free app, um, doesn't cost you anything. Um, but uh, if you're interested in looking at that, that would be a good one to take a look at. Those are most of my slides. Another thing I think I will just jump in on. Sure. Sorry about that. I had a little bit of an audio glitch there. Um, so just uh, another thing I'll I'll, I'll kind of mention is just adaptive gaming. Um, I don't know. We do a lot with um, different types of things like virtual reality, artificial intelligence, um, and uh, lots of folks. I don't know if you guys work with folks who are interested in um, mm -hmm. games and things like that. There is a lot with adaptive games. Um, Microsoft came out with an adaptive controller recently, which has been um, quite popular and interesting for folks to talk about and how folks with disabilities can get access to games. And so um, uh, it's definitely, uh, we have a couple of those in our loan library uh, and we've got a whole assessment kit for folks who enjoy games on whether it's Xbox, PlayStation 4 or the Wii units, uh, lots of different adaptive controllers, so that really anybody with any ability can actually use those and play those games uh, effectively. And so um, that's kind of what I had for today. Are there questions? I want to make yes. sure I give enough time for that. Yes, there are. In regards to gaming, we're actually, um, in the next few months, I'm hoping to have Able Gamers do a presentation for us. Oh great. Oh. oh great. Yeah, they're great. So that's yeah, that's great. one of the main they've been around for a long time and they've been they've been advocating for adaptive gaming for a long time and so um yeah, great great folks to have on. We we will um, be yes. um I'll I'll let you know in September we are going to be doing a full day um looking at innovative AT and that's where we're going to take 
portion of that day and dig into adaptive gaming. So if you're interested in cool. that, um, you can sign up for our listserv to learn more about our full days by going to EasterSealsTech.com. Um, and you can get some notifications and get the opportunity to sign up for that. Uh, again, we stream that online, but we'll be spending a whole day on adaptive gaming, artificial intelligence, and um, oh. virtual reality that day. Very cool. Um, so, yes, we do have some questions. Uh, with regards to the used, com used computers, personal equipment can be donated, correct? So, like, if I have an old computer at home... Yeah, so we take any any computers. Yeah, so it doesn't have to be. Yeah, it doesn't have to be a uh, company equipment or, or those kinds of things. It can be personal equipment, and we will we provide you with a um, certificate of data destruction. Um, and so we wipe okay. those computers to the Department of Defense standards, um, and we'll print out a sheet and give you a certificate that basically verifies that we've deleted all of your private private data on that computer. But is it okay if I want to take out the hard drive before I donate it? You can absolutely. If you if, if you if you would rather do that, you can absolutely. Excellent, because I know there's some some people who like to make sure they put nails through it, you know, pretty much right. destroy it. So yeah, sometimes we'll <laughs> um, if we've got a hard drive we can't use. Um, we'll, we'll go ahead and take it apart and use a hammer on it. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, how much does the clinical assist assistive technology cost for the evaluation? So we charge at just hourly for our services. And so depending on how complex the needs are, the, the price varies a little bit. Um, but our hourly rates, um, we charge 125 per hour um, for consult our consultation and evaluation services. Um, and then... Um, our training services are $100 an hour. And is that typically covered through um, Medicaid and private insurance? Uh, it depends. Um, so one of the things that we run into here is a lot of times, I, I, I think one of the challenges that we run into is, and I've been talking quite a bit with folks about this, is um, a lot of times, Medicaid won't pay for an evaluation. They'll pay for the equipment, but they don't pay for the evaluation to recommend or to be able to decide what equipment's most useful, um, specifically with regard to these types of devices, assistive technology devices. Um, and that's primarily uh, one one reason is 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 we're not uh, our staff are are assistive technology professionals and they're not therapists, um, so they're not a physical okay. therapist, speech language pathologist or um, or an occupational therapist. And so uh, services aren't typically covered. And so um, on a case by case basis, sometimes we'll do private pay for those individuals. Private insurance has stepped in at different times, depending on the insurance company to be able to provide that evaluation. Um, uh, it's really kind of case by case or individual by individual. Okay, so that's good to know. Yeah. Okay, so next question. Uh, Warbly is a program to purchase, correct? Correct. Verbally, there's a free version um, of Verbally um, on the iOS store and on the Android store. There's also then, if you want all of the bells and whistles within Verbally, there's Verbally Premium, I believe, and that's $99. Okay. Okay. Uh, pro lo quo. How much yes. is this? I've heard it is expensive. It is. Um, I don't know the price offhand. It's upwards of. It's a. It's more than two hundred dollars. I know. I know that. Um, but it's one of the more expensive augmentative communication apps out there. Okay. Um, somebody said, great information, Brian. Thank you. And I wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly agree. Um, so um, uh, I've been learning on my spare time about the breakthroughs in rehabilitative engineering. Although robotics-based rehabilitation, such as telehabilitation and Benend Effector robots, the exoskeleton type robots widely demonstrated to be effective. They are not yet part of routine treatment in most settings. This is primarily due to the fact that most studies include ad hoc robotic devices that are not mass produced. 
and although commercially available, not necessarily affordable. How many years may it take before it can become part of an OT or PT practice or general medical practice? Any ideas on that? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, so yeah, robotics are kind of one of those, again, up and coming things. I don't think anybody really has a prediction when it'll become mainstream per se, but uh, uh, we've got a couple of different interactive robots on our side, nothing for rehabilitation or therapy or those kinds of things um, like those exoskeletons would do. Um, I mean, uh, it is one of those things that's being developed and I, I would I would assume probably within the next five to 10 years would be my guess when those become really mainstream in places um, like rehabilitation settings. Okay. Uh, and if you guys are interested in um, future webinars that are being put out by Brian and Easter Seals Crossroad, if you go to the Easter Seals Crossroads website, they post all of their upcoming events, um, and you can easily register for them there. So definitely you know, keep an eye on that. Um, I don't know if you guys keep a list list serve or anything where people can get emails on a regular basis with updates. I'm guessing you do um, so that people can get notified about coming events. Yeah. So if, yeah, if you go to our main page, it's right there on the screen. It's eastersealstech.com. Uh, you can go there and on the right hand side of the screen, it'll, it'll say something to the effect of put your email address here. I mean, that signs you up to our listserv. And I, I always tell folks, we don't spam you. Um, we're not going to send you 50, 60 emails a year. Um, you're going to get probably somewhere around 10 or 12 emails from us a year, basically telling you when our upcoming trainings are and, and, and whatever announcements we have to share. So um, it's real simple. And again, we're very sensitive to the fact that we don't want to spam anybody, but we just want to make sure we get out good information. And so you'll probably get about 10, 12 emails from us at the very most every year, um, basically letting you know that uh, we have an upcoming training or event. Um, and another quick question for you. Is there, um, like I know on the Medicaid waiver, we have some services that, um, you know, we can help with um, adaptive equipment, things like that. Um, is there any services that you know of off the top of your head within Medicaid waiver that, um, because there's, um, there's a particular service called INSP, which is a waiver service for assess, inspect, and train. Do you know if that could be utilized to cover the cost of um, an evaluation and learning how to use uh, that is not to my knowledge, um, but I would love to explore that. I'd love to know more about those funds and to figure <laughs> out if they could be used because, uh, yeah, it's it's been something that um, I'm sure as you guys probably experience as well, we're trying to figure out ways to get the, the cart that before funding. the horse, right? Or the horse before the cart. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, we all have lots of people that, you know, we work with and that, you know, we very much want um, to be able to provide, you know, services and especially those assistive technology kind of things. Um, so, yeah, we're always trying to figure out. Um, so that would be wonderful if we could because um, yeah. I know that's under – I'm looking at this – our, our – uh, waiver manual right now to see if I can find a little bit more about that service standard. So we'll have to look into that a little bit further. Maybe there is some way that that can be figured out because um, that would be wonderful. So, okay. Let me see if we have any other questions. Anybody else have any questions for Brian? Lots of really great, great information. Um, really very, very helpful. It's amazing if, how far we've come. Do, I, if they do have questions and they want to ask those offline, I'm happy to, if, I mean, give me a call at the phone number that's on the screen I'd, or send me an email at tech at easterseelscrossroads.org. Love to be able to guys, we'll love to be able to get you guys the information that you need. 
um, for the particular situations that you guys are running into. And I, I have referred consumers and their families in the past to Easter Seals Crossroads, and they've been nothing but wonderful to work with, um, and families have been really, really pleased. Um, I know somebody noted they saw you yesterday at NARF. Yes, and yes. They got so much. <laughs> They got so much information from you yesterday, not enough time to get a full meeting of all that's out there. Um, you know, wish you guys had an office in our area, um, which we happen to cover the northeastern part of the state. So right, I right. think we any of us would have, be glad we to have, you have in our two, area. We have two employees in your area. We have uh, one person in Rochester, and then we have one person in Fort Wayne. So uh, okay. we have two folks um, on our clinical staff who are remote employees up in that area. Awesome. So that's good to note. So. Mm -hmm. Very, very helpful. Okay, well, I don't want to take up more of your time than necessary. We're at an hour, and again, the information you've provided has been just wonderful. Um, thank you so, so much for your time. We really appreciate it. I know there's probably going to be lots of people signing up for your webinars in the future, um, and we'll definitely be able to utilize this. So thank you again, and you have a wonderful weekend. All right, take care. Have a good one. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, for the Advocacy Link staff, please go ahead and move over to